I'm Chris Stafford, and you're listening to the Wisp Sports News Desk. This is Season 4, Episode 19, and we're recording on May 25th, and with me is my co-host in the UK, Nancy Gillen. And, Nancy, I think before we get into the conversations about the women's sports news, we really, both of us, I think, feel... um, it behooves us to recognize what happened here in the States yesterday, and that was yet another school shooting uh, resulted in the multiple fatalities, 19 elementary school children, uh, some adults, including teachers, um, and, and still some injured children are in hospital. And I, I think... When we sit here and every week and we want to talk about sport, usually the feel-good stories about sport, the, the highs and lows and of sport and how sport impacts a life, I think when we have such horrendous news, Nancy, it really puts everything into context um, because, as you know, we have far too many killings, uh, caused by gun use in here in the states more than anywhere in the world. So I I just want to say before we get into the sports news this week um, that we both of us uh, are thinking about this obviously like so many people in the world and certainly it's in the hearts and minds of most people here in the states this morning um, that we really want to reach out and extend our condolences to everyone that's been impacted by this um, because it's just horrendous thinking of how all of those families, Nancy, um, that are without children, the communities, their friends, the children that have survived and how they have to all move on. It's, It's really hard to comprehend the grief that they must all be feeling. So... Uh, I don't know if you want to add to that, Nancy. Um, yeah, I think just reflect what, what you said there. Um, like you said, it's kind of a story that, yeah, it's kind of been made, uh, is you know, all around the world, everyone's aware of what's happened. So, yeah, I think just to, re- to reflect what you, you say and, and like you said, just puts everything into perspective a bit, doesn't it? It really does. Um, and, and we just want to extend our... Our condolences to 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 everyone that's been impacted by this, um, near and far, and however close or not close you were to this, but it it really does have a devastating impact on on us all. So, um, with that, uh, Nancy, um, I know we've got a lot of sport to talk about again this week, and we're going to lead with football because I know there's a lot of football news one way or the other. So I think. The good news, let's start with some cheery news, um, which came out of uh, Europe last weekend, and it was a a game that we both watched, the Women's Champion League. That was some wonderful soccer, football, sorry. That was some wonderful football there. Very, very entertaining. It was, yeah, and it was two um, heavyweight teams in in, in women's football in Europe, so Barcelona and Lyon. Um, and yeah, interesting kind of dynamic between the two teams because Leon are, are kind of traditionally uh, the powerhouses in Europe. So they've won, um, I think it was, uh, well, now they've won eight uh, Champions Women's Champions League titles in the past decade. Um, but it was Barcelona that won the Champions League last season when Leon were having um, quite a significant dip in form. So I think uh, as well, there's the whole... Uh, narrative that kind of Barcelona are currently the best team in the world and they've you know been getting in you know 90,000 people to watch them at stadiums and they've kind of you know seen as the pinnacle of women's football and I think uh, a lot of um, well I think there's you know Leon, but also I think other footballers as well maybe saw that as a bit you know the narrative around Barcelona as a bit disrespectful to Leon when over the past 10 years they've been technically the most dominant force of women's football so yeah there were a lot of different kind of narratives around the final which which made it more exciting and then the the action on the pitch itself was also just brilliant I think for, for anyone that didn't see it it was um 3-1 to Leon but all four goals came in the first half um so Leon went 3-0 up and just kind of completely obliterated Barcelona in the first 
something like 20 minutes. Um, Barcelona got a goal back. And then in the second half, it they were really threatening. And there, there was a point where Pateas hit the crossbar from the halfway line. If that had gone in, it could have been a completely different game. Um, and they had a lot of uh, good chances missed, really. So I think they will, you know, it wasn't it wasn't completely one-sided. It was a very open game. And, and yeah, Barcelona definitely had their chances. But it was just brilliant. It was so entertaining. And I know... Um, uh, you want to talk a bit about Amandine Amandine Henri's goal? <laughs> yeah. um, the opener goal, opening goal in six minutes. I think that goal just set the standard for the whole match because yes, it was six minutes in. I think she was like twenty five yards out, if not more. Uh, she just got the ball and absolutely smacked it uh, into the goal, and it was it was it was brilliant. It was one of the best goals I've seen uh, all year. Well, I think one of the best goals in, in football, I mean, all credit to her because we should just back up a little bit here. She uh, she had a tackle um, just before that when which she fell. So she composed herself. She had about, I think, about five or six very short strides to compose herself after she got up from that tackle um, and and just hit, hit it, smacked it right into the corner of the top corner of the net. Top right hand bin, I think it was, and and it was an extraordinarily powerful goal. Given that she had lost her momentum by having fallen and having to regain herself in such a short distance, to bang that one home. So I mean, particular credit to her for that kind of recovery and equilibrium. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, uh, yeah, and just uh, yeah, the composure to to score the goal that she did and. So early on in in a Champions League final as well, it was uh, it, yeah, it was brilliant. So um, credit to her, and and and, yeah. and you know who I'm going to give a shout out to now was the other I, goal. I do, yeah, <laughs> Katerina Macario, of course, plays for USWNT, uh, one of the rising stars in the game. I just love watching Cat play, uh, and that was she was in the right place at the right time. What can I say? Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's no. Um, you know, the scoring in the Champions League final was a massive achievement. And I think she got, was it nine goals in total, I think, through the whole totally. tournament? So, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for the, for the kind of, you know, the top competition in Europe, it's, it's very impressive. Like you said, one of the rising talents in the game. Um, so, yeah, she, she was pretty good for Leon as well. Yes, she certainly was. And it was fun that she and Lindsay Horan, of course, uh, also a US player, uh, were playing. And I... I don't know if uh, if Lindsay's contract has been extended. Do you, or is it just Kat that's uh, co- co- further contracted to Lyon? I'm not sure, to be honest, but I think it's a bit. It's always a bit tricky um, with the going from Europe to the US because I imagine if Haran was to go back to the US, she's now kind of joining after the season started. So I don't know if there's a you know how that works really. Um, so yeah, I'm not. I'm not too sure. But yeah, interested if she did go back to the US, where she'd be heading. Yeah, well, we'll watch that one, of course. The season's well underway here. Uh, Kristen Press uh, produced um, produced, and she didn't score an own goal, but she produced. She set up a goal um, that turned into be. It was credited to her, I think, but it was an own goal. Did you see that at the weekend? I didn't see that. No, no. She she managed to cross it. Uh, right off the line, and and it and it came off the defence into the goal. So uh, she set it up, <laughs> but there was no yeah. one there on, of her team to to <laughs> pop it home. So she had to rely on the opposition to score an own <laughs> goal for her. <laughs> Yeah, nice to see she's settling in well and back playing. Very much so. And she's playing really well, really well. I shouldn't sound at all surprised. I'm just like, yes, you know, I'm not surprised. But, you know, after she took her break, a a mental health break and did a little bit of touring in Europe and just took some time off for the sport, she seems to have come back very fresh and very ready and, and with all the instincts that she had before and playing really well. So it will be very interesting to see if these veterans, and I think we've touched on this before now, Nancy, whether these veterans will come back into the into the team, into the national squad, with so much talent in in the tiers below them, uh, I'm talking about you know they being the veterans, right, and then all of these younger players that are making their mark of being on the winter training squads. Um, you know how these veterans are going to get back in, like the you know Alex Morgan, Megan Rapinoe. Uh, 
what about Ali Krieger and Ashley Harris? And I mean, there's so many goalies too, right, to choose from. Um, and then, and then, of course, Christian Press and Tobin Heath. I mean, it. it <sighs> What do you feel about this now? Do you feel any differently? Do you have any new insight that you'd like to share with us? Um, apart, not really new insight, I suppose, is my opinion, um, which is I don't think that they will get back into the team, to be honest, um, just yeah. because I think it is a new era of the USWNT. That's maybe uh, press and d- d- maybe depending on where Heath goes, because I suppose they're more actively playing. Um, I know Rapino is playing as well, but... Yeah, I think because, you know, there's now been this new kind of squad in the US WNT and, you know, you've got people like Macario Macario coming through and and stuff like that. I think it's... Trinity Rodman, Sophie Smith. I mean, you know, I mean, the list goes on. Yeah. It's impossible to... I mean, I don't think you'll ever go back to how it was here, like the 2019 World Cup. Like you might get like one or two or three of them in the squad. Lindsay Horan, of course, is another one. Yeah, I think Haran should definitely. A crystal gun. Haran you know. should definitely be included for sure. I think if you're in a Champions League winning team, that should be. Um, and Crystal Dunn just had a baby. Um, congratulations, yeah. Kristen. She just had a little boy last week. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, she'll want to get back. I mean, she's absolute fire in the midfield, isn't she? I, and uh, and then, of course, um, you know, there's all the players, the, the you know, the squad that, that did hang on. Um, you know, I'm thinking the players the, the, from the old squad, if you like, that that are still in there. But yeah, I think it will be. Um, you know, Rose Lavelle is one that comes to mind. You know, she's still playing on the squad. She's still named on the squad. She's still playing very well. But likes of Juliet, uh, yeah, I wonder when if she'll ever come back and if if they'll make room for Crystal Dunn. You know, we will see. It's it's going to be an interesting year because uh, World Cup's not that far away, right? We don't no, have the Euros. Up to, but... Coming up to a year away. Yeah. Just pretty close. Mm-hmm. Any more on the Women's Champions League then? Did that tell you anything differently about the, the state of play in Europe right now with the Euros coming up this summer? I, I suppose it just kind of raised the anticipation and excitement for the Euros um, just because it was such a great match and so many of the players on that pitch will be representing their country at the Euros. Um you know, like the the likes of Ada Hegerberger, who's returning to the national, the Norwegian national team set up. You know, the, the large majority of the Spanish team play for Bar, so you've got a lot of French players. Um, I thought Basha, Selma Basha, the um, one of the Lyon defenders, was brilliant, and she's going to be in the French national team. Um, so yeah, it just made me more excited. Just shows how competitive the Euro is going to be, I'm especially considering when there was not a single English player in either of those two teams. Not to say that England don't have a strong squad because we do, but that just shows that the depth of talent for other countries as well. So yeah, just uh, definitely made me or me more excited, and I imagine it's the same for a lot of football fans everywhere. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. And not, let's not for, um, forget that Vivian Miedemeyer, she's staying with your club, Arsenal. Yeah. And plays for the Netherlands, of course. So another force to be reckoned with. But you won't have to deal with Sam Kerr. Sam, Sam get a bit of a break now. I know she was over here with her girlfriend, uh, Christy Muris, uh, this past week. So I don't know, she just have a bit of time off or is there something happening with the Australian national squad that she'd have to return to? I... Not aware of anything. They've probably got some friendlies, but there's. I don't think there's a continental competition. Um, and yeah, I mean they've qualified for the World Cup as um as hosts anyway. So I don't right. even think they have to play in qualifiers. So you now I think she gets a full break, which is concerning for <laughs> next season when she's probably going to come back really rested. Because obviously true. last summer she had the Olympics, so didn't get yeah. as much rest. Well, she's had a super season, so she deserves a good break now before she has to pick up her national duties again and return to Chelsea. Now, I want to come to Chelsea because they won the double, as we've talked about here, and now they have new owners. So Emma Hayes, of course, is seems the, the manager extraordinaire and, uh, you know, leading her winning team there. Presumably she'll stay with the team. What, what's next? Yeah, I personally think she'll stay with the team. I think there's been a few kind of rumours and stuff, but I think most of it's kind of like made up. Um, I don't think there's anything like in, from her indicating that she will want to leave. I think especially because, you know, like that question, where will she go next? 
apart from going into like a very good team in men's football, I can't really see her um, kind of moving. Like, why would she go to any other team in women's football? Mm. I suppose the big thing for Chelsea now is is the Champions League. Like, um, which you know we just talked about Leon and Barcelona being the two dominant teams in Europe. Um, I mean, Chelsea went out in the group stage last season. Uh, Arsenal were the the team from England that went the furthest and they got to the quarter final. So like the English teams aren't quite there yet. I know Chelsea got to the final um, when Barcelona won, but yeah, I think for her, it's going to be the Champions League and like really pushing on to, she's won a lot of trophies in England now. So it's about looking to Europe, I think. Um, and yeah, like you said, they've, they've got new owners. I think that's quite interesting. So it's a guy called Todd Bowley, who's um, taken over and he, is already a part owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I know he's also got ownership of the Los Angeles, is it Sparks, the WNBA team. And then he, there was also, he was also part of a bid to take over, I think it was North Carolina Courage, um, which didn't happen, I think, because he was then going to Chelsea and that would be conflict of interest. But he obviously sees value in women's sports and women's sports teams. Um, so that bodes well, I think, for Chelsea for the women's team uh, because he obviously sees yeah, the value in it and will probably be willing to invest and, and make sure that Chelsea stay the best team in England and yeah, potentially win the Champions League in, in maybe, maybe next season, but you know, in the next kind of few years or so. Yes. I'm sure she'd love to get her hands on that trophy. Uh, well, yeah. let's, let's move on to um, um, other news of, you know, women, making history in women's sports um, and in football particularly because you mentioned their men, the men's game and, and it would be interesting, wouldn't it, to see you, you, you wouldn't be surprised, let's put it this way, if a, if a male team, men's team did want uh, to Emma Hayes um, <laughs> as their manager but we want to talk about some female referees now that are going to be refereeing um, the World Cup, they're officiating the World Cup for the first time so that's another milestone for women in football yeah a massive milestone um so this is the men's world cup that's uh, happening in qatar in uh, november and december so um yeah 36 officials picked in total including three women so that's uh, stephanie frappart salima mukan sanga and yashimi yamashita um so frappart in particular i know i have heard of because um She's officiated a lot of men's matches before, and I think she was involved in um, an England match, like an international match. Um, so yeah, she's she's relatively well known. And then uh, Mukan Sanger as well. She um, refereed at the Women's World Cup and the Olympics, and then similar to Yamashita as well, who's also done that and has a was the first female referee to take charge of an um, AFC Champions League fixture, so the Champions League in Asia. Um, so yeah, obviously very, uh, you know, this not, this is not just like a, you know, tokenistic move. The all three women are incredibly qualified and experienced and yeah, it's amazing to see three women as well. Um, and not, you know, not just one, like there's going to be multiple. Um, and then there's also, uh, three female assistant referees who have also been picked. So news are back. Catherine Nesbitt and Karen Diaz Medina, um, will also be going to Qatar to be assistant referees. So yeah, it's just really good seeing kind of female representation increase across the board in football, not just on the pitch, but in things like officiating as well. Yeah, good for them. Good for them, making history. Um, well, before we get away from football, I did just want to mention um, it's an article I saw about the women's the Euros in 22, which we, we mentioned just now, um, that they're expected to shatter attendance records this year. That they're, they're predicting between 435 and 525,000 tickets to be sold. So, yep. again, another milestone, Nancy. Yeah, massive. Um, I think that's expected to comfortably exceed the levels of attendance at the Euros in 2017, which I think at the time that Euros, which was held in the Netherlands, was deemed to be a success. So, you know, kind of exceeding that again is is brilliant. Um, I think it's definitely the signs have been there, like the final sold out, the openers sold out, all of England's group stage games are sold out. Um, A few other group stage games are sold out as well. So... Obviously, as the tournament goes on, people will probably want to go along and, and more tickets will be sold. So, yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm 
incredibly excited for the summer and I think it's really going to transform women's football in England um, and hopefully people that have never been to a women's football game before um, maybe you know get a ticket and come along because it's yeah it's going to be really good. All right. Well, uh, as we mentioned last week, the French Open Tennis Championships were beginning this past weekend on Sunday. We're into now uh, fourth day of play, Nancy, and there have been some major upsets, haven't there, already? Yeah, there have. It's been um, already very dramatic. So we're yeah, kind of in, into the second round, but some of the first round um, upsets. Um, I think the one I was most surprised by was Ons Yabur, the Tunisian tennis player. Um, I wrote something um, going through the five favourites in the women's tennis tournament. And she, I think behind uh, Switek, uh, she was, Jabur was my uh, second pick just because she's um, been really good on clay so far this season. And she won the Madrid Open earlier this month as well, reached the final of the Italian Open. So it seemed like she was in brilliant form. But yeah, lost in the first round of, of the French Open uh, to Poland's Magda Lynette. So um, yeah, that was a bit of a shock. I think she was kind of expected to, yeah, really kind of, you know, I think her half of the draw will be pretty um, happy that that she's gone out because she was a big threat. Um, the defending champion, Barbara Kretschikova, um, she... Yeah, she won the French Open last year, um, which was a bit of a surprise as itself because she was an un- unseeded player. Um, but yeah, she, again, I think this is kind of maybe less of a surprise and it's an upset because of her status as defending champion because she hasn't played uh, recently because of, um, I think it was an elbow injury that she picked up at Indian Wells. So she came back in time for the French Open and yeah, I think it was an issue of lack of fitness. Um but she probably, you know, came back a bit early because she wanted to defend her French Open title. But yeah, it was it seemed like it was a bit too early for her and, and she's she has gone out. Uh Gabin Gabin Mugarufa, the Spanish player. Uh she's another former winner at Roland Garros, but this was quite a while back in twenty sixteen. Um but still she, you know, she's been fairly informed recently and won the WTA finals last year. Um and yeah, I think uh, lost to Kai Kanepi. Um, so she's kind of, I remember as well, the Australian Open, she, there was, there was, I can't remember who she beat, but she's, she's kind of quite uh, one of those players that is not too high in the rankings, but always seems to upset some of the big names. Um, Naomi Osaka's out. So she lost to Amanda Anis Mova, uh, the same player that she lost to at the Australian Open in right. January. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she seems to have got the hang of her, doesn't she? So yeah, she does, <laughs> and she she always seems to come off against her at Grand Slams as well. Yes, yeah. So Early yeah, on. and then yeah. Annette Contevi as well, the fifth seed. Um, she lost in straight sets to Australia's Alger Tom Janovic, um, and yeah, Emma Raducanu lost today as well. So. Maybe that's not too much of, a, of an upset, but I suppose that's a, the current US Open champion going out of the tournament. So, yeah, a lot of a lot of um, kind of favourites and seeds going out. But for me, it's still kind of maybe not irrelevant. But just in the form that Argus Vitek's in at the moment, you can't. You know, she she definitely is going to win it. Like I would put. I'd be very, very, I'm very, very confident that she is going to win it. So, you know, despite all these people that have gone out, uh, Switek probably would have found at some point she would have come up against them and beat them anyway. So, (laughs) yeah, but it's been very exciting so far. Yeah, super exciting. Well, I can see where your confidence lies. And but whilst... (laughs) The players are really wanting to be focusing on Roland Garros, right? They've been distracted somewhat with the news coming out of Wimbledon that uh, they're going to they, they're going to um, remove rankings points from from Wimbledon, uh, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, no, three weeks, three weeks in June, uh, and this this has been a major distraction for them, isn't it? And and those those points have been stripped after Russian and Belarusian players were banned from competing um, at at Wimbledon um, because of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So where does this leave the other Grand Slams, Nancy? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, I suppose... Because I found it all very interesting just in the 
grand scheme of things, that tennis's reaction to, um, you know, banning uh, the Russian and Belarusian players has been completely different to every other sport because it's happened in every other sport and people have accepted it and that's just been the the what's ha- the process for what's happened basically in tennis it's very different um so they've russian and belarusian players they uh haven't been banned but they have their like there's no sign of their nationality they don't uh, have the flag uh, the flag doesn't appear next to their name they don't you know their anthem isn't played all of that um, but they're still allowed to play every tournament and that's been what's happened since uh, february until yeah wimbledon banning them um and then, yeah, so, so ATP and WTA have kind of responded by by stripping Wimbledon of the ranking points, which is uh, it's, it's interesting because it seems it's a bit kind backwards, of- doesn't it? It really does seem backwards. You know, when you and you say it, it, this this is not in other sports where where the Russian and Belarusian athletes have been banned. It it, it that's gone the way of everybody's you know everybody's feelings really that n- n- no one has complained about that. No one has said, hey, no, you can't ban them. I mean, from the IOC down. So this is really is extraordinary. And you've got players like Blissikova, the Wimbledon runner-up, who she said she'll drop out of the top 10 if she can't defend the points. And it's, and it's yeah, and, the wrong decision. And I think it, the Australian player that we were talking about before that beat Contefi in the French Open, uh, Tom Chavonic, um, mm-hmm. she, cause she reached the quarterfinals of Wimbledon last year um so the majority of her ranking points come from Wimbledon because she can't defend them she's just going to fall like massively like 40 50 places down to like 80th or something Extraordinary. um it's yeah and I think that's why for me it doesn't quite make sense because ATP and the WTA have made this de- decision because they said you can't discriminate against players but then that their decision seems to discriminate against players because anyway. there's going to be players that are going to like fall down the rankings I think it's the players that are you know around the like 200 300s as well or like 100 to it is quite rankings are quite important because of like earnings and stuff like that like that's that's a big deal I think they're they've, they've also the ITF has stripped rankings from the points from uh the wheelchair and, and junior events as well so it's kind of like a blanket thing and yeah, you've had some big names like Pliskova. I think Asaka has said that she isn't sure if she's going to go and play because it's kind of like, what's the point? Um, and there's friends so yeah. of the top players maybe joining them too, which just seems extraordinarily the wrong way around. You know, I don't know. Upside yeah. down, inside out and the wrong way around. Yeah, it seems to, to see, it seems to have been like that. Obviously, there's a group of players that want to be able to play at Wimbledon and now it's just caused like an even bigger fuss. Um yeah, the whole thing I find, I just, I do find very interesting. Yeah, but tennis seems to be the inverse of the rest of sport and the, their attitudes towards it. Um, you could probably do a deep dive into why and and how that's come about. But but yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame because obviously Wimbledon is such a great tournament. And well, this is overshadowing, like you said, the French Open. It will overshadow Wimbledon. And it's just, it is a shame that whoever wins Wimbledon, it doesn't mean as much, basically, you know, or whoever, it doesn't. It does, as a, you know, watching it, it still be a great sporting spectacle. But in terms of kind of the players who will want to play and rise up the world rankings and defend their points from last year, it's, it doesn't uh, it's make a shame sense if you if you ban the Russians and the Belarusians, like most sports have done, but you penalise the rest of the world. Yeah, it's it is very strange. It, it's a hey, backwards. All right. We'll keep you posted here. <laughs> if that, you know, that might, I don't know whether Wimbledon would um, back out on this one, whether they would uh, rethink it after the storm that it's created. But you know, they haven't got much time to do that, so uh, I'm not holding out any hope. But we'll keep you posted here on the show as always. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, the uh, former Olympic medalist Katana Mikato Takana Katana. Um, she the, seeks to protect women from sexual um, objectification. This is story out of Tokyo, isn't it, Nancy, that was on Inside the Games. Tell us about that, because that's interesting, given what we've just lived through with that Tokyo. Dealing. Yeah, it is, it is quite interesting. So, yeah, Katani was the sports director for Tokyo 2020 for the Olympics. And, um, yeah, during she she's kind of essentially working to 
stop female athletes from being uh, sexually objectified kind of when they're um, photographed. So during the games, there were um, a series of measures that were introduced to ensure that this didn't happen. Um, so she, yeah, she's spoken to kind of Kyoto News about uh, what, what they did at the games and, and how she's kind of continuing to do this work. So yeah, during the games, she said that they had the right to check images that people took that were deemed suspicious and ask people to delete them. Um, and that the rule was clear. So violators would be ejected, rejected. And that she said that athletes perform better when they were in a um, safe environment. Um, and then she also um, kind of is urging sporting bodies to do more to make sure that female athletes are protected so um, she said sporting organisations have to find creative ways to stop covert photography. I hope our efforts at the Tokyo Olympics improve Japanese society and lead to a better future. Our work only becomes meaningful when that happens. Um, and she also praised, I, I don't know if you remember this, Chris, but the German gymnastics team who um, didn't wear a leotard for the for the competition, they right. wore like a unitard, so they wore their yeah. trousers as well. So yeah, I think Katani there um, kind of praised them because the, the they wore the unitards as a protest against the sexualization of women in sport. And uh, yeah, Katani said she was impressed at how they took action to empower female athletes and promote values through sport, what, rather than just thinking about how to win or perform well competitively. So yeah, it's a, quite an interesting interview. If um, yeah. it's well worth a read. Definitely. Well, good for her. All right. We've got a, a doping ban, a story, which we haven't had for her last few weeks uh so tell us about this one something about acne medication yeah this was a really interesting story that came out um towards the end of the last week last week over here in england um so one of the women's super league football players uh chioma ubugagu uh so she plays for tottenham and she has in the past plays played for england uh she received a ban for nine months um for essentially using um, like acne treatment. So she would used to play in the US and was prescribed this by a, a dermatologist uh, for her acne. And then she made the move to Tottenham. Um, and then, yeah, basically kind of the... She explained later, I read an, an interview with her where she, because she moved during the, the pandemic, all the medicals and stuff were done virtually. So somehow this uh, medication that she was on um, or like putting on uh, slipped through the cracks. So she only found out when she'd like uh, texted the team physio saying that she wanted um, a re-subscription, re, uh, you know, to get an, a repeat pres prescription and texted him what it was that he was like, oh, this is a banned substance here. Um, that she realised. So yeah, it was quite an interesting one. I think um, as well, it was it's not performance enhancing, but it's a diuretic, so that can uh, cover up. That's why it's on the banned substance li list because it it can cover up other substances that people may may take to enhance their uh, performances. But yeah, I think again, just well worth like having a read of of the story because it's I, it's something that I've obviously you see a lot of this kind of non. Um, you know, acting without full doping violations and stuff. But I haven't seen a story quite like this. And also in football as well, you re you don't really see doping bans too much. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting. And I, you know, I would be very interested to see whether the same ban would have been given to like a Premier League male player, um, whether they would have found a way to appeal it or, you know, because I've never seen, yeah, just never seen anything like it before. Uh, yeah, it's very unusual. Um, yeah, it just shows you really have to be so diligent about what you're taking, you know, even yeah. though it's not performance enhancing, it's just you know, something you would think would be as benign as, uh, you know, some ac acne medication. But yeah, anyway, she seems to have taken that on the chin and uh, it's going to serve her nine months ban. Uh, when did that ban start, Nancy? How is she, so, would she have been in uh, a contender for the for the Euros, was she was she was she was with her. Um, no, she she wouldn't have been, would she? No, even, even though she played for um, a European squad. No, oh, no she she yeah she does she uh, has played for England in the past, so she's got three England caps, but she's not really in the squad anymore. Um, she she wouldn't have been in contention, but um, yeah, so the the ban runs out in October, so I think this was she was given the ban. Um, you know, like quite, it must have been, if that's October, it must have been, yeah, February time and they've only just like announced it now. I think now the season's end, they, 
have explained why she wasn't playing. Um, so yeah, she's she's got about four months left and, and over the summer as well. So she's not actually missing out on too much football. So yeah, I'm sure she, she'll be relieved to be getting back on the pitch soon. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck to her. And we're going to wrap up this week with um, a happy, another happy story, a happy story about motor racing, because if there's one name that we've become very familiar with here on the show when it comes to motor racing and specifically the W Series is British driver Jamie Chadwick. It, the, the rest of them simply cannot catch her, can they? She won again. Yeah, she's having a incredibly dominant start to the W Series um, season. So she's secured her third W Series win uh, in Barcelona. Um, so, yeah, she she's basically just... No one can really catch her. I think every race, we, we when we talked about it before, she's always been um, challenged by Abby Pulling and Alice Powell. They've always gone really, really close to her for the majority of the race. But then Chadwick uh, just pulls away at the end. Um, so, yeah, she's got, she's got maximum points, is at the top of the leaderboard on 75 points. And... Uh, next is Abby pulling on 38 and Alice Powell on 33. So she's she's already got an incredibly uh, healthy uh, buffer between her and, and her opposition. So if she was to win um, overall, it would be her third W Series title uh, in a row, which just shows yeah how dominant she is. Well, she's got to wait a few weeks now because uh, they didn't come back until Silverstone in England um, in, uh, in Northamptonshire. That's on July 1st and 2nd. So she's got a bit of a break here. But I'm looking at the, the you know, you get the related stories um, and Chadwick's headlines like Chadwick starts on in poll, Chadwick wins again, Chadwick wins W Series, and on it goes. Chadwick starts hat, hat trick bid. Uh, it's going to be all about her this season. <clears throat> but, you know, it's a tremendous experience and grounding for her. And hopefully another rung up the ladder towards Formula 2, Formula 1 for her. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the aim for her. And uh, like you said, I, well, I think it shows kind of her dominance that she's maybe needs more of a challenge anyway. So I would hope that if she does win the W Series this year, it's next year she will be yeah work, starting to work her way up the, F, the F3, F2, F1 ladder. Yes, Jamie Chadwick, British driver, extraordinaire. Well, good luck, Jamie. We will be following you for the rest of the series. And as I said, that starts up again in July in Silverstone. Have you ever been to a Formula One track, Nancy? I have. Oh, I, no, I haven't. I've I've because I've been to Monte Carlo. I've seen like that's like in the city. So I've I haven't been there when there's a race on, but I've like seen it. But oh, it's potentially, might, yeah, yeah. I m- I might be able to hopefully maybe get to Silverstone this year, but we'll see. Keep, 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 I'll keep you posted on that. That's a great uh, track. I actually, um, yeah, I went to a Formula One race, you know, when, when, yeah, they have the Formula One some years ago, the British Grand Prix. Um, and I also, and I don't tell many people this, Nancy, but I also rode go karts at Silverstone. Did you? Wow. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> it was, I should explain what it was. It was a media. Um, fundraiser for the British team an Olympic fundraiser um, and we were asked to select, choose a team and there was myself and Claire Balding and um, Elizabeth Firth who's a photographer Kit Houghton another photographer and Kate Green who's a journalist um, and I have to say it was darn good fun because we were out there on the track, you know, on the part of the track. Uh, extraordinarily good fun. And we raised a good deal of money um, for, for the British Olympic team. So, hey, uh, don't ask me to do that again, though. No, yeah, it sounds, like, sounds like a great experience. Yeah, it was great fun. All right, well, that just about wraps it up for this week, Nancy, doesn't it? Uh, unless you've got any other breaking news, because I know you've got some personal breaking news, haven't you? You've got a big event this weekend. Well, yeah, going up to the Lake District to do a trails half marathon, um, which, yeah, should be an interesting experience. I haven't done too much training um but even if it's you know you're just walking up the hills and running down that's that's fine by me so yeah it should be really really fun looking forward to it well yeah it should be all about having fun right it's it's not like the london marathon which you are setting out now to win one day (laughs) so this is all about this a fun in between event for you 
Yeah, exactly. This is this is a, a day off from my hardcore <laughs> endurance running training. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, hopefully you, you get some decent weather, you know, perfect con- temperature for, for running and, and have a great weekend there. And you're doing it with some friends. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, we're camping and then doing this run. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Well, good luck with that, Nancy. You'll, you'll tell us about it, how it goes next week here, I'm sure, on the show. Now, before we go, I want to give a shout out to Marcy Corniger. You know, you know, Nancy, Marcy is hiking the Pacific Crest Trail. She, she and I recorded our first episode of the Amazon special series about her hiking the, the PCT, Pacific Crest Trail, which is on the West Coast here of the States. 2,650 miles. She started on May 12th down at the Mexican border and she's now 200 miles in. I spoke to her on the weekend on Sunday when she was 180 miles in and that episode is available at Wisp Amazons or on the Wisp Sports main channel as well. And then she uh, resumed. She got back on the trail and she just yesterday clocked up 200 miles and she crossed over I-10. If any of you know, I-10 goes east-west out of L.A. uh, It's straight into the desert. So she's still in triple-digit temperatures in the desert. Uh, Plenty of rattlesnakes out there and extraordinary difficult conditions. But uh, Mars is a trooper and uh, on she goes. So we'll be catching up with her again down the trail, literally, maybe in a few days when she stops to get another shower and uh, do her laundry. That's the only way we can catch up with her, Nancy. Yeah, I mean, that sounds, yeah. Like, I, t- I think I was meant to last week, but I'm like reading a book about women doing the PCT at the moment, and it just sounds like such an incredible challenge. So, I, yeah, really interested to, interesting to hear how Marcy's getting on. Yeah. All right. Take a listen to that again on the Wisp Amazon channel or the main channel, the Wisp Sports main channel. Show notes, as always, at wispsports.com. We're on social media at Wisp Sports and Nancy. I'm at uh, Nancy underscore Gillen on Twitter, Nancy Gillen underscore sport on Instagram. And then uh, Gimme Sport W, that's that's where all of Gimme Sport Women's articles are. All right. Well, until next week, when Nancy comes back and tell us, tells us how she got on with that run. And that's it for us again. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Enjoy your sport. 